I'm gonna start this video with a brief story of what led me here. A few years ago I got really serious about milling the biggest wood I could possibly find and it's been a great adventure ever since. One of the more time-consuming tasks related to that is having to surface these large slabs to remove the cupping and twisting that happens as they are drying and the bigger the wood, the longer it takes. Using a router sled is a very popular and a cost-effective way to achieve that and it was one of the first tools that I built for myself. But not too long ago it came face to face with a patch of wood that came loose and somehow got jammed in there and completely destroyed the bearings on the router. However, in the summer of 2018 I bought parts to build a large CNC, but I never could find the time to get the project going. But now with a broken router, I will be forced to get this project underway. Now you know the backstory, and this little guy can go bye bye because this new machine is absolutely amazing. But it ended up being kind of a bumpy ride, and we got off to a bad start. I'll admit that uh, it bit me pretty bad in the in the hand. Uh, it was a stupid mistake on my part, and there's going to be a, a separate video about that. But this video is going to 100% focus on building the components or machining some of the parts and putting the stuff together. We're gonna to begin with what was the easiest part of this whole build. I bought a big chunk of steel to use as the main gantry. It's a rectangular tube and the dimensions are 250 by 150 millimeters with a wall thickness of eight millimeters. I then had it sent to a machining center that had a mill large enough to fit this 2.5 meter long rectangular tube and the linear rails need to sit on a very flat surface, so both the top and the bottom where the rails sit was milled flat. They also drilled and tapped all of the holes for the rails and the bearings for the ball screw, which in total ended up to be 80 holes. There would have been no way for me to do that with any meaningful precision, and not to mention the eternity would have taken me to do all that by hand as well. It actually turned out to be cheaper as well to do this rather than buy a large aluminum extrusion to use as a gantry, which is what a lot of CNC machines is made of. The rest of all this stuff I bought from a company in Sweden called JBCNC that included all of the linear rails, the bearings, ball screws, spindle motor, stepper motors and so on. The variable frequency drives and all the electrical stuff was neatly fitted in a unit that I would just plug into my three-phase outlet. It was fitted with breakers and a emergency shutoff. I have no affiliation with the company who sold me this and I must give them a huge amount of credit for helping me whenever I had any questions. The guy you want who runs the company, he even took the time to FaceTime me a couple of times when I needed some help to figure some stuff out. So what I had to do on my part was to machine this chunk of aluminum. I do have a milling machine and a lathe it's not something that I use hardly ever. Uh, whenever I do use them, it's mainly for small stuff. And the thing about machining is that you're so dependent on tooling and I did not have the proper tooling for this job. My milling machine has an ISO 50 taper and it takes these OZ collets. My set of collets, they start at 10 millimeters and go up from there. The problem was that all the holes needed to be six or eight millimeters in diameter and I don't have a drill chuck either for the mill. And if you're new to machining, this is what makes it different from a drill press. Using these types of collets allow the machine to do work with very fine tolerance as it grips the tool very precisely around its diameter. Now I could have just taken the time to order more collets, but as always, I was in a hurry to get this job done. The second problem was that this block of aluminum 
was too wide to fit within the jaws of my vise, so I had to clamp it down to the table. This of course wouldn't let me access the entire surface as I was face milling, so I had to remove and reinstall one clamp at a time to get access to the corners. The problem with that is if your stock is not flat to begin with, the clamps will most likely bend it to sit flat on the table once you release the pressure of the clamps the newly faced super flat part could spring back, then it wouldn't be flat anymore. So then what was the point of doing this on the mill you might ask? Well, at least I was able to get this part to be very square in its dimensions. Something I knew was going to be critical, as I would need very precise reference surfaces when I was laying out the holes, which you will see a little bit later in the video. So I had this SketchUp drawing that I had been working on, and I also transferred some of that to just some basic paper. And that's pretty much what I went by. And of course, I, I checked the measurements and all that before I actually drilled the holes just to make sure that whatever was in the drawing was actually a representation of, was, of what was, you know, being made. So it was a, a little bit sketchy at times, but in the end, yeah, that seemed to work out pretty good. Just as a side note here, using SketchUp for projects like this, as long as you get somewhat proficient at using the program and its features, it is then really easy to do these types of drawings. This lets you get a very good idea of how different components need to come together, and it's easy to spot any potential problems. So to summarize, SketchUp drawing good, monkey brain trying to figure things out as he goes, bad. I'm sure the machinists out there are screaming at their screens right now. I have them hanging over this edge here by, by a few millimeters because I need to be able to access the sides here, the ends, to mill them nice and square. And I also, I'm hoping that I'm able to do some, uh, do some squaring up right here at the sides as well. Uh, just enough so that I can put it up on this edge and it will be able to sit here in the vise, which should be fairly square to the machine. At least as square as I can get it. This is probably not how the pros do it, but as I said, I'm out of options here. I need to make this work somehow. On the back of the plate, the face that meets the linear bearings, it has a slot in it that needs to be 16 millimeters deep. That was to allow clearance for the ball screw nut. It had to be just right. Okay, so right now I'm doing a 10 mm slip holder and it's a 16 mm depth of cut and I'm feeding it at 112 mm per minute. So, so far it seems to be holding up. I'm giving it a little squirt of oil. Uh, not the best lubrication. Too tight oil. and the nut would drag along the steel gantry and too loose and it will lift the ball screw putting strain on the bearings over at each end. Well it turned out I got it exactly 16 millimeters deep but somebody had made a mistake when checking the measurements in the drawing so that somebody had to go back to the mill and take off two millimeters on the overall thickness to reduce the depth of the slot to 14 millimeters which if I had double checked my measurement I would have gotten it right the first time. Going off some very carefully scribed lines, I could then punch center marks for the holes I need to drill. This is where having all the sides square was very helpful. I made 16 8mm holes all the way through for the linear bearings and for 6mm holes for the ball nut. Now, ball nut is a funny word. Maybe you saw that the heads on the screws was sitting on the surface of the aluminum block and that's no good. They needed to be countersunk and the only way for me to get a flat bottom in the countersink was to use an end mill. Now luckily this time I had the right size collets to mill the countersinks for both of the different size screws. And since I did this on the mill, I can use the scales and the digital readout to make this task a breeze. This also let me verify that my center punched holes were in the right spot as well, since the countersink would have been off-center otherwise. <laughs> 
Now that the heads of the screw wasn't in the way, I could then carefully position the bearings for the shorter rails and mark out the holes. I used gauge blocks to align the outer edges of the bearings with the aluminum. I would then return to my crappy old drill press, but these holes did not go all the way through and when cutting the threads I would open the belt cover on the drill press and turn the belts by hand while applying pressure on the quill. And this was my process for all the holes that needed threads and it was very tedious. The last bit of machining I had to do on the aluminum block was to cut a slot on the front face as well. Again, to make clearance for the other bolt screw nut. I used the mill to figure out how deep I needed to make this slot. And this was determined by measuring the height of the nut and comparing that to the height of the rails as they sat on the back of the front plate that the spindle motor mounts to. And here it is all finished up. So this is the components for the up and down of the spindle motor. This is the back side of the plate where the motor sits at the front of this. There's no way for me to get this distance set just right, even though I have a little fancier caliper. Uh, I need them to be 161.2 millimeters. The spacing, the outer spacing. And it's critical to get this just right. They need to be, you know, at the tenth of a millimeter or even less, or else it could bind. But I'm not gonna tighten these fully yet. So I'm just gonna get them a little bit snug, but not so snug that I restrict any movement because there is, of course, some play here in these holes. The holes are oversized. So if I just barely tighten this down, I can still move this rail a little bit. And since there are four points of contact over at the other side, you know, the carts that meet up with these, if I then put them just snug, but not tight, then they will hopefully self-align. The only downside to that is this plate might not end up being totally square. It was a really close fit, but I had to loosen the screws for the bearings as well. That's a lot better. I was able to do this just a little while ago, but now it doesn't seem to want to go. Oops, it is. We just needed to give it some persuasion. So there we go. That feels really, really nice. Once they were all aligned, I could then tighten all the screws. I used gauge blocks again to get the ball screw centered perfectly in between the linear rails. I took into account the length of the shaft coupler when positioning the ball screw. I then carefully marked the holes using a drill bit that matched the inner diameter really well. And then I headed over to the drill press once again. And then I could finally assemble all the parts and see my beautiful creation come to life. Dukti robot tillbaka. Long this. So overall, it was a, a really good learning experience. I do have experience with automation and, you know, machining and, and things like that from my, my, my day job. Uh, but that was at a steel mill and just a whole different scale, really. And sometimes there's not much thought that goes into the actual tasks that you're doing when you're doing woodworking. You know, just, you know, and there you have your sander and you have your little router and uh, you're doing these physical things. Whereas at the milling machine, it's more psychological. So whenever I get to use the, the milling machine and the lathe, it's, uh, it's really fun. It's a, it's a totally different world from, from woodworking.
I grabbed the last of my aluminum extrusions to use as legs for the gantry. I installed some bearings so that it rides really smooth along the length of the table. But I need to point out that all you see being done right now is more or less temporary parts that either need to be redesigned a little bit or changed out completely. Because my master plan is to have this be a fully CNC operated router, so then additional linear rails, bearings and gear racks would need to be installed. But for the time being I will operate it manually and my first tests of this machine really blew me away. The power of the 10 horsepower spindle is such a massive improvement over my old CMT router. And it's worth mentioning that the CMT in terms of power sits at the top of what you can buy as a handheld router. The spindle motor has more than three times the power. The advantage of having a bolt screw is I can just count the number of turns as I move the spindle along the x-axis. As the bolt screw moves the nut 10 mm per revolution, 4 turns on the screw gives me a 10 mm overlap when using a 50 mm diameter cutter. The dust shroud is a must have if any wood shavings or dust settles on the beam that the bearings contact as the gantry moves along the table, they would gum up on the bearings and not make it by the smooth. That would also have a negative effect on the surface finish on the wood. So the area that the machine is able to work is 190 centimeters in its x-axis, 22 centimeters in its z-axis and 500 centimeters in the y-axis. Hopefully sometime in the future we can revisit this and do another video on making this CNC operated. Let me know in the comments if you think I missed anything or if you have any questions. And as always, thank you for watching and I hope to see you on the next video.